continue our study of Luke's gospel, we arrive at the birth of Jesus. Last week, we looked at the birth of John the Baptist. Of course, he is the prophet of the Most High. We learned that he is the one who gives knowledge of salvation to God's people and the forgiveness of their sins. And so John the Baptist's mission was to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And in Luke's narrative, it makes sense that Luke would begin with the birth of John the Baptist and then lead into that with the birth of Jesus. Now, typically, in our passage today, Luke 2, 1 to 21, we normally read it at our Christmas Eve service. And it's dark, and we're holding candles, and it's cold outside. Today, it's light, it's June, and it's blazing hot. So you might have a little bit of disorientation reading about the birth of Jesus here on June 30th. And we know this passage very well. It's going to be familiar to many of us. But let me encourage you to think deeply about this passage and ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh insight into this most popular text. The best thing about God's Word is no no matter how many times you read it, over and over and over again, the Holy Spirit can always give you fresh insight and fresh application to your own life. So let's not rush through this passage or assume that we already know everything about it. And let's begin reading in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Just imagine that it's December and you're holding a candle as we read this. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was consumed in the womb. As we work our way through this text today, I want to point out to you three things about the birth of Jesus. Number one, the birth of Jesus fulfills Scripture. Number two, the birth of Jesus is for the humble and lowly. 
And number three, the birth of Jesus is for treasuring and telling. So number one, it fulfills scripture. Number two, it's for the humble and lowly. And number three, it is for treasuring and telling. Number one, the birth of Jesus fulfills scripture. Luke sets the historical context for us when he tells us that the birth of Jesus took place during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Let me give you some Roman history here. Augustus, previously known as Octavian Augustus, was born in 63 BC and was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. And after the murder of Julius Caesar, Augustus was named his chief heir. And he ruled in a triumvirate, which means three people, along with Mark, Antony, and Lepidus. Now, eventually, Augustus defeats Mark Antony in battle, and he is acknowledged as sole Caesar in 27 BC. And he reigns until 14 AD. So it is the reign of Caesar Augustus or Octavian Augustus who reigns from 27 BC all the way to 14 AD. He is the Caesar that Jesus is born under. And he is known as being a very peaceful ruler and one who brought great organization and administrative skills to all of Rome. One of the ways that he brought organization to Rome was by keeping track of the people that lived in his empire, which is why we have here this decree that goes out that everyone should be registered. So what is Augustus doing here? He is providing a census. He is wanting to know everyone who he is responsible for within his empire. Now, he's not doing this because he actually cares about the people in his empire. He's doing it for tax purposes. So he asks everyone to return to where they are from and be registered. This means that Joseph has to leave Nazareth and return to Bethlehem, which is the place of his family lineage. And this travel back to Bethlehem is important because it fulfills the scriptures about where Jesus would be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 tells us this, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little, To be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So many years prior, Micah's prophecy communicates to us that Jesus will be born in this little town of Bethlehem. One of Luke's favorite things to do especially in these early chapters of his gospel, is to show you how everything that he is explaining to you is fulfilling what Scripture has already said would happen. And so the return of Joseph to his ancestral home in Bethlehem is fulfilling prophecy. And it is also the way by which Augustus would figure out How can I tax all these people that come from all over in my empire? The point of this census, the point of this decree, is for one reason. It is for us today to see the sovereignty of God in every single thing that happens in this story. From Augustus' standpoint, he was the one who was in charge of the entire world And he could get people to do whatever he wanted them to do. So he issues this decree. And people are traveling from all over, returning to their homeland to register. And all he had to do was say it. And the people responded. But God uses Augustus and this census to fulfill his plan for Jesus being born in Bethlehem. It is not Augustus who is the sovereign ruler here. It is God. 
God is the sovereign ruler of everything that is happening, not only in this story, but even in our world today. Now, Augustus was largely responsible for what is known as the Pax Romana. You've probably heard this before. It means the peace of Rome. God, as the sovereign ruler of the universe, appoints Augustus to be Caesar in Rome at a time when great peace and prosperity was taking place in the Roman Empire. This is the moment in which God ordained that Jesus would be born. In a peaceful, prosperous Roman Empire. So peaceful, in fact, that later on you have men like Paul and Peter and the other disciples who are able to travel all the various roads throughout the Roman Empire to be able to expand the kingdom of God. Nothing happens outside of the control of God. It is a peaceful time. It is a prosperous time. The Roman roads are being built and developed at this time. And this is the moment in which Jesus is born, which helped the gospel spread to many places that it had never been before. So when you look at this decree, when you look at this census, I'm talking to Christians now. Christians, consider your own lives just for a moment. Reflect back on some of the experiences that you've had, either good or bad, and know that none of those experiences were done in vain. That God orchestrates all the events of our lives for His glory and for our ultimate good. Now, when I say for our good, that doesn't necessarily mean that the temporal circumstances are always for our good. Sometimes they're very difficult. Just this past week, Nick and I went to visit Gary and Donna Story, and they were sharing some of the ways that God had been providing for them, even in the midst of the difficult circumstances that Gary has undergone, and now he's had a liver transplant, and his new liver is functioning wonderfully. But the point to which they're at as of a few days ago, where they can see the whole trajectory of everything that happened and can praise God for his goodness and his glory, the circumstances that brought them to that point were not always easy, as we know, as we've been praying faithfully for them for many months. But God has been sovereign over Gary's health. And now Gary and Donna can look back on this ordeal and see all of the ways that God was working. So whatever your circumstances are today, or whatever it is you are wrestling with God over, remember, He is on His throne. He is the sovereign ruler of the universe. Augustus is really not in charge of anything in this story. God is setting up all the pieces in place For this time, for Jesus to be born in a peaceful, prosperous Roman Empire, and it just happens to be Caesar Augustus, who is the pawn, if you will, that God uses to bring about his glory for his people's good. So number one, we see in this passage that everything that happens is fulfilling what Scripture had already said would happen. But number two, we see that the birth of Jesus is for the humble and the lowly. So while in Bethlehem, Mary goes into labor, the 80 miles from Galilee to Bethlehem in her condition, whether it be on foot or whether she was on a donkey, probably some combination of both, imagine how difficult that would have been. How exhausting for someone so late into their pregnancy to go by foot or by animal, on an 80-mile journey. And this is all Luke gives us in verse 7. He says, She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Don't romanticize this verse. This was not an easy thing to do. The accommodations for Mary and Joseph, they were not ideal. There's no hospital There's no sterile environment, no doctors or nurses, no medicine, no other family, as we know, to assist them or to help them. So listen to this description from one commentary. It says, if we imagine that Jesus was born in a freshly swept, 
county fair stable, we miss the whole point. It was wretched, scandalous. There was sweat and pain and blood and cries as Mary reached up to the heavens for help. The earth was cold and hard. The smell of birth mixed with the stench of manure and acrid straw made a contemptible bouquet. Trembling carpenter's hands, clumsy with fear, grasped God's son, slippery with blood, the baby's limbs waving helplessly as if falling through space, his face grimacing as he gasped in the cold and his cry pierced the night. This is what happened when Jesus was born. Not some beautiful, well-cleaned, washed-off child that's just laid gently into the manger in a nice, warm, fleeced blanket. If you've ever watched any movie where a child is born, aren't you always amazed at how beautiful the child looks as soon as the mother gives birth? No evidence of blood, sweat, tears, just this perfect image of a beautiful child in a mother's arms. If you've had children, or if you've been in the room, or if you've been in the room when you've had grandchildren, we all know that's not how it happens. And so don't romanticize what the description Luke gives us in verse 7 to be. This was not an easy birth. These were not great conditions. The humble birth of Jesus foreshadows for us his humility and his meekness throughout his ministry. Jesus devotes so much of his time to the poor, to the marginalized, to the oppressed. And Luke, more than any other gospel writer, picks up on this theme throughout his account. And at the same time that Jesus' ministry is on the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed, he doesn't spend time with them to make them rich, accepted, or free. So, if we take the poor around us and we help them find a job and we teach them how to budget their money and we help them become financially independent but do nothing about their spiritual bankruptcy, then we failed. We failed. Because the gospel ultimately is about addressing the spiritual bankruptness which we all have. If we take the marginalized around us and we help them become socially acceptable members of society, but do nothing to address their spiritual condition, again, we have failed. If we take the oppressed around us and we free them from whatever earthly chains they are bound to, but share nothing with them about how to release them from the bondage of sin, then we have neglected our duty to proclaim the good news of the gospel. This is what Jesus says himself in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. Listen, he says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So I'm not saying that we don't care about the poor or that we don't care about the marginalized, or that we don't care about the oppressed. I'm not saying that we don't spend time with these people and do good deeds towards them. But if we neglect to share the gospel with them in the midst of us doing good deeds, then we have failed in our mission. The Great Commission is not about being financially independent. It's not about making independent Americans. It is about making people who need the gospel, who need Jesus to save them from their sin. Jesus came to do what, ultimately? To seek and to save the lost. Part of realizing that we are lost is acknowledging and realizing our own sinfulness. You know, the reason that Jesus had so much success with these types of people, the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the reason he was so successful with that group of people in the Gospels is because they had none of the things of the world to occupy their hearts and their minds. All they had was Jesus. He met the spiritual condition that they needed. And the problem for many of us is we don't realize our need for Jesus because we have all the things of this world to distract us and to occupy our minds and hearts. Notice 
in this passage. Who is it that the angel of the Lord appears to? Shepherds. The angel of the Lord doesn't appear to Caesar, to another important Roman official, to the Sadducees or the Pharisees or to the high priests. The angel of the Lord in this passage approaches and appears to shepherds in a field, those that were on the outskirts of town. It is the lowly and the humble in this story that are the first to hear that the Messiah has been born. Look at verse 10. The angel said to them, that being the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. Every time we've seen an angel appear in Luke's gospel, the angel always says, fear not. That's always the first thing that is mentioned. But this angel brings good news, not just for the shepherds in this story, but for all of the people. The word for people here is not a generic universal term for all people in the world. It is actually a reference to specifically the Jewish people. The Messiah came to save his people from their sins. Now we know in the context of Luke's gospel that eventually the message is expanded to include the Gentiles. But here in Luke chapter 2, the focus is on Israel. The birth of Jesus at this point in the story is good news for his people. And in verse 11 we're told, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is the only time in the New Testament that we see Savior, Christ, and Lord appearing together in the same verse. Luke is telling us here all of the various things that this Messiah, that this Christ, that this Lord will do. Now what makes the birth of Jesus Good news. It's pretty obvious at this point, hopefully. The reason the birth of Jesus is good news is because he is the Savior of the world and the only one who can provide forgiveness of sin. So this ties us back into what we were talking about last week. It's not good news because Jesus is a great teacher. It's not good news because he's a miracle worker or a compassionate friend. Though he is all of those things, Jesus being born is good news because he's the only one who can save us from our sins. So being good fathers, good mothers, good grandparents, good employees... Good coaches, good citizens, those are all wonderful things. But apart from the gospel, we can never receive forgiveness of sins. It doesn't matter how good of a father or husband I am. It doesn't matter how good of a pastor you think I am or maybe you think I'm not. Those things do not make me right with God. The only thing that makes me right with God is the forgiveness that I receive through Jesus Luke 2, this passage, means nothing if we don't properly understand the significance of Genesis chapter 3, where we read about Adam and Eve partaking of the fruit which God commanded them not to. We call this sin. Their sin has now been transmitted to every human being that existed since then. God's plan of redemption, which really begins in The end of Genesis 3 with the promise, but ultimately in the calling of Abram in Genesis 12. Now, Luke 2, a visible, tangible reminder and evidence of the plan to forgive sin in the birth of Jesus. Look at verse 14. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Who is God pleased with? Those who receive his son as savior. Those who acknowledge their sinfulness and are humble enough to cry out to Jesus. So the shepherds leave excited and they go quickly, the text tells us. They go with haste to Bethlehem to see this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. It's the humble circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth that serve as the sign of for the shepherds. So this wasn't a pomp and circumstance type birth. 
It wasn't a traditional royal birth. It was an unimpressive, not flashy, uneventful, borderline disgusting birth. This is Jesus' birth for us in this passage. So we should consider, what is Luke teaching us here? We live in a world where bigger is better. Flashy is in. Charisma is prioritized. This was not the type of ministry that Jesus had. He worked quietly. He retreated many times from the crowds. He told people not to tell other people when he performed miracles. He devoted his time and his attention to going deep with 12 men rather than going superficial and shallow with thousands. So brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you, based on how I observe Jesus' plan of ministry in the Gospels, is to simply be faithful with who God puts in front of you. What does that mean? If God brings one person in your path, this is, this is kind of how I operate. If, if God brings one brother to me who has a desire to go deeper in God's word, then I'm going to go deeper with that brother. If he approaches me and say, I, I want to know God's word better, I'm hungry to grow, uh, can you help me do it? I'm going to take that as God bringing that person in front of me to then invest in. So I don't need 40 people or 400 people in a Bible study to feel like I'm being obedient to do what God has called me to do. All I need is one. One person that I can devote time and energy to that has expressed an interest in reading Scripture together, praying together, confessing sin together, whatever it might be. So my question to you is, who has God put in front of you? Who has God put in front of you? whoever it might be, and devote time to that individual. Devote time to reading scripture with them, praying with them, confessing sin one to another with them, encouraging them. Do it for six weeks. Do it for eight weeks. Do it for three months. And then when it reaches a natural concluding point, pray and ask God to bring another person into your path where then you can do the same thing about it. It's the word of God, as we talked about this morning in our community group mix-up. It's the word of God that does the work. So we allow God to work through his word. One book I would recommend that you pick up if you are inexperienced in doing this, it's called One-to-One -One Bible Reading. Basically, it's a short little book that explains how you could gather with another believer or maybe another couple of believers and simply read God's word together. Read a passage, talk about it, apply it to your lives, pray through it, see how it moves you to perhaps confess sin or see how it moves you to practice the spiritual disciplines better. It's, it's not rocket science. God is putting people in front of us all of the time that he knows we need to encourage and pour into. Just look for the people that God brings in your line of vision and be in God's word with him. This is what Jesus did. Like I said, he devoted his time to going deep with 12 as opposed to staying shallow with thousands. So the birth of Jesus is for the humble and the lowly. But number three, perhaps the most inspiring part of this whole story is the contrast that we see between everyone else in the story and Mary in the response to Jesus' birth. Number three, the birth of Jesus is for treasuring and telling. So when the shepherds arrive, Luke tells us that they tell others about what the angel of the Lord had revealed to them. We don't know who all was present as they reported what they had been told, but we know that it was more than simply Mary and Joseph at this point. And Luke, he provides a contrast here between those who, as he says, wondered about what the shepherds were telling them, and then Mary, who the text tells us, treasured and pondered what the shepherds reported. 
So one commentator, Daryl Bach, he wrote a really big commentary on Luke. He says that the word being used there for wondered does not indicate that those in the story who wondered ended up professing faith in Jesus as the Messiah. They were maybe amazed at what had happened, maybe even impressed with the story, but there's no indication from Luke's gospel that any sort of internal transformation happened by the group of people that simply wondered at what the shepherds reported. And isn't this true for so many people that we know? They know the story of Jesus. They're amazed at it, intrigued by it, impressed with it. They might even wonder about it, but it doesn't lead to conversion. It just remains a story that they read at Christmas time. It's no different for many than like an attraction you might find at the circus, like the man who walks the tightrope. I'm amazed that he's able to do it, although I think with enough time I can figure it out myself. I'm amazed that he can do it, but I just leave impressed with the fact that he walked on a tightrope. It doesn't change my life. It doesn't transform me. In contrast, though, in this story, we see Mary's response. She's not simply intrigued. Look at verse 19. This is so insightful, so beautiful that Luke gives us this. Mary, in contrast to everyone else, treasured up all these things pondering them in her heart. Mary knew something was different about Jesus. Now, she had been told, of course, by Gabriel, but she now experiences it as the shepherds reported back to her what they had been told by the angel. And she did not let the moment pass without thinking about it. She didn't let it pass. She pondered. She treasured. She thought deeply about it. She reflected on it. I don't think Luke is telling us here that at this point, Mary had it all figured out. I don't think that's what he means. But she is willing to think deeply about the things of God. So we can relate to this. This is what we would call the spiritual discipline of meditation. I was reading just a couple weeks ago about how many of our brothers and sisters in Christ that lived in the 1700s and the 1800s, how they approached meditation, the Puritans specifically. They called it deliberate meditation. And it was an eight-step process that they used when they were ready to meditate on a biblical text. And I want to share with you what that eight-step process is. Number one, they would read the text. That makes sense. Whatever the text was that day that they chose to focus on, they would read it. Then they might take one phrase or one verse out of that passage, and they would memorize it. Then they would meditate on everything they possibly could from that specific verse. Just meditate on it. Everything that they could possibly think of and know about from that verse, they would just sit and chew on it. Over and over and over again. Then, after they did that, number four, they would pray. A very important step. Then, they would, what they would call, they made holy resolutions on how to change their life in light of that meditation. So, basically, that's a long way of saying they applied it. Number five, they applied it. Number six, they wrote down in their diaries what their application was based on the meditation and the memorization of that text from that day. Then after they wrote in their diary, they would sing a song. A song of praise to God, whatever it might be. A song we sang this morning, a hymn that you love, another praise song that you like to sing. They would sing it. And then number eight, they would close in prayer and thanksgiving. That's the eight steps. Read the text, memorize something, meditate on everything they knew about it, pray, make holy resolutions, record it in their diary, sing, pray. That's what they call deliberate meditation. Now, obviously, I wasn't trained how to do this as a child, 
or even as an adult. But when I read this, I was like, I'm going to try this. So I took Ephesians 1, 15, which is for this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. That's it. That's, that's Ephesians 1, 15. I took that little verse, and I spent 10 to 15 minutes doing everything that it said here. I read it, memorized it, meditated on it, prayed through it, applied it. I actually don't think I wrote it down, so I broke the rule. Sang a song in my head, and then prayed again. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this every single day, but the point is, when I read Mary here, treasuring up all these things and pondering them in her heart, I think this is how we are to approach the whole counsel of God. Treasure it. Ponder it. Dig deeply into it. Don't just think about it when we're here at church on Sunday or in community group, but every single day. Take a phrase of a verse and recite it in your head all day long throughout the day. And as you do that, ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh insight into whatever that phrase or that verse is. So as I was meditating that day on Ephesians 1.15, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, guess who I thought about? You. My brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that love the Lord Jesus. Those that I know have faith in the Lord Jesus. The people that I gather with every Sunday morning. And so as I thought about specific people in our congregation it led me to what pray for those specific people in the congregation that's how meditation works this is how we should ponder and treasure all of god's word the birth of jesus is also worthy of our meditation if mary spends time pondering and treasuring the birth of jesus should we not do the same And look at the response of the shepherds in verse 20. Based on what they had heard, it says, the shepherds returned. What were they doing? Glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The birth of Jesus leads these shepherds to worship. The application for us is that telling of this wonderful story is just as important as treasuring it. They went to Bethlehem to tell everyone that could possibly listen what the angel had told them. So should we. We should tell this story, the story of Jesus' birth. But it is not just some isolated, feel-good Christmas story, but we should tell the birth of Jesus as a part of the entire gospel message of God loving humanity so much that he was willing to send his one and only son to a sinful rebellious planet and this son Jesus lived the perfect sinless life and died as the sacrifice in the place of those sinners Jesus is worthy of our worship not simply because he was born of a virgin but because he remained sinless he was sacrificed on a cross he was resurrected three days later and he now sits at the right hand of the father the birth of Jesus matters ultimately because he had to be born to die and he had to die to be resurrected this is what we sing in all praise to him which is Reed and I's favorite the line is who lived to die who died to rise, the all-sufficient sacrifice. That's the lyric from that song. The birth of Jesus Christ should lead us to tell the rest of the gospel story. And in verse 21, we learn, in good traditional Jewish fashion, that Jesus was also circumcised on the eighth day, the same way that John the Baptist was. And Mary treasures this message. The shepherds told this message. And we are now commanded to carry on this tradition of treasuring and telling anyone that will listen. So may we as a church, by the Spirit's power, proclaim the good news of the gospel, the birth of Jesus, his sinless life, his perfect sacrifice, his glorious resurrection, for the purpose of all people knowing that there is a way to be reconciled to a holy God through Jesus.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for Luke's account of the birth of your son. We thank you for the way Mary treasured and pondered and stored up all of these things in her heart. God, she didn't have all the answers yet. I'm sure there was still much confusion and uncertainty. But she received the message and treasured it. God, may we do the same. As we approach the Bible, there's many things as we study and read it that sometimes don't make sense to us, that we need further clarification on. But God, may that not prevent us from treasuring it and telling others about it. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the birth of Christ, which ultimately leads to his death and his resurrection, which gives us forgiveness of sin and ultimately power over sin to be reconciled to you, a holy God. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.